Dr. Shalini, for setting the context extremely well. I'm going to be spending the next few minutes specifically addressing gestational diabetes. So we will begin by uh, asking whom do we screen? Slides this way, yeah. When do we screen? What test will you use to screen? What are the cutoffs that you need to take? And how do you manage moving forward, okay? So any uh, ideas or guesses? Whom do we screen? Do we screen all people, all pregnant women, or pregnant women who are beyond a certain age, anybody with a risk factor, past history, PCOS? How many people for all? Okay, okay, fine. I think uh, there is a, uh, although universal screening of GDM is what is to be done, uh, some professional bodies might say that uh, look at the risk factors and then decide for yourself. And these are the risk factors for gestational diabetes, right? We know we are an ethnicity predisposed to diabetes. There are very few people in this country who don't have a family member with type 2 diabetes. Very few people whose BMI falls under the safe range. Very few people who are not leading a sedentary lifestyle. So if you see any which way all of us tick off at least one or two risk factors, which essentially means that we must be screening almost all the women uh, who are pregnant, okay? I hope uh, that is clear, okay? So that's the answer. Now, when do you screen first? Dr. Shalini told us first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, the definitions are different, but should we check only at 24 to 28 weeks or should we also check at first trimester? So if you take a look at how insulin resistance usually pans out during pregnancy, it, there is actually an improvement in insulin resistance in the first few weeks between 8 to 12 weeks, but thereon it progressively increases from the 20th week to uh, near term, maybe not term. So it would make sense if you're only testing once to check at 24 to 28 weeks, but it might be important to screen all our women in the first trimester or maybe even at the booking visit, primarily because pre-existing diabetes is extremely common in our country and we cannot wait till 24 weeks till we do our first test. So the answer to when is at first point of contact, right? So this is primarily to detect overt diabetes if it's not been diagnosed, but also to diagnose GDM, right? So definitely at 24 to 28 weeks, if it was normal in the first trimester, there is also some recommendation to say that you might need to check again in the third trimester if the woman is at high risk. Now, what test do you use to screen? Okay, so uh, OGTT is the gold standard for diagnosis. 75 grams OGTT, if you can do a fasting value, give 75 gram glucose and do a one hour and two hour, then these are the values that you should be looking at. Notice that the level of cutoff is much lower than it is for non-pregnant individuals. That is primarily because during pregnancy, the fetus is drawing glucose from the mother, so the values are much, much lower. Any one abnormal value suggests the diagnosis of gestation diabetes. This is the IADPSG or the ADA recommendation. In this endeavor, if you find fasting sugars greater than 126 or two hour value more than 200, you have overt diabetes. Now, if you cannot bring in your patient on an empty stomach on a fasting state, do you not screen then? Not necessarily. You can do a 75 gram glucose test on a non-fasting state and do a two hour postprandial glucose value. If that is greater than 140, you can make a diagnosis of GDM according to the DIPSI recommendation. And what's the logic behind this 140 at two hours is this. The IADPSG values were decided at an odds ratio of 1.75 from the HAPO study. If you calculate the numbers for an odds ratio of 1.5, the two hour value corresponds to 140. It would make sense for us to lower our odds ratio for detection, primarily because Dr. Shalini has highlighted that we are an ethnicity who's at very high risk of gestational diabetes. So if there's only one value that you look at, this is probably it. So when would you choose which test? Of course, with IADPSG, there's a slight risk of over-diagnosing, and with DIPSI, maybe you're missing a few individuals who have gestational diabetes. But if you're, if you're able to meet the patient regularly, able to plan it, then maybe you can do an OGTT and ask them to come on an empty stomach. 
But if it's a patient who's coming from 300 kilometers, we don't really know if he'll meet her again, then definitely it would make sense to do a non-fasting 75 gram glucose to our value. I hope that makes sense. But irrespective of what your circumstances, uh, it is absolutely necessary to definitely screen and not miss the opportunity. So that is to quickly summarize all that we've spoken about GDM diagnosis. Management, what should be the first step of management? The good thing about GDM management is that almost 80 to 90% of women in clinical practice can be managed just with lifestyle changes. So the first step in management is to first monitor sugars, identify where the sugars are rising, and then advise medical nutritional therapy. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Pramila is also going to be talking about this in some detail, but the principle of management of diet advice during uh, pregnancy is the fact that your postprandial sugars are likely to be higher than fasting sugars in GDM alone. Pre-gestational diabetes is a whole different story. So it would make sense to provide smaller meals, split three ways and three snacks, and encourage them to move a little right after the meal, maybe about uh, 45 minutes to an hour after the meal for about 10 to 15 minutes. All of us consume less protein than recommended. All of us consume less uh, complex carbohydrates or vegetables than recommended. So always, always work, work towards improving them. And all of us consume a lot of processed food, which can also be done away with. What should be the targets of treating hyperglycemia in gestational diabetes? Preferably, your fasting value should be somewhere less than 90, and your post-meal one-hour value between 120 to 140. This correlates with birth weight, and we want to optimize the birth weight. So uh, this is something, one-hour value less than 140, two-hour value less than 120 uh, is a reasonable way of looking at it. Now, if you're not able to control your sugars with medical management uh, or dietary changes alone, what do you do next? The preferred treatment during pregnancy for hyperglycemia is insulin, insulin, insulin. It's recommended and endorsed by all uh, societies which are available. It's the safest form of medication available because it does not cross the placenta, so there is no effect of insulin on the baby, so it is a safe medication to use. This has been uh, endorsed by the Indian uh, guidelines as well. There are numerous advances which have happened with insulin over the last few years. We don't have the time to go into the details, but we have uh, insulins now which can match the profile of blood sugar rises during pregnancy to target the postprandial spike which happens and the fasting value which might go low. We also have longer acting preparations of insulin which can make sure that your chances of nocturnal hypos are low. Glargine is still off-label used during pregnancy, whereas Levimir is approved for use uh, in pregnancy by itself. Of course, NPH is an option. But one thing to remember with gestation diabetes management is that not all patients might require all four shots a day. So the best way to assess this is to get them to make the dietary changes, check their sugars, and try and analyze the pattern. You might be just having a woman who needs a bolus dose maybe before dinner alone and nothing maybe before breakfast and lunch. You might have a person whose sugars rises only during lunch. So you tailor the treatment according to the glycemic excursions in your patient. Why not tablets? Isn't it easier? Women are juggling so many things. Why would you add insulin to the mix? Primarily because uh, the oral agents which are approved for use during pregnancy are metformin, glibenclamide, and acarbose. Acarbose, very, very few uh, studies, uh, not recommended by most guidelines, but metformin and glibenclamide have been, but they are category B drugs. So a category B drug means this, that uh, both metformin and glibenclamide can cross the placenta. Metformin carries some risk of preterm labor, some risk of preeclampsia as well. Glibenclamide comes with the risk factor of neonatal hypoglycemia and also macrosomia. But uh, any day, uh, these should be agents which should be your last resort. And in situations where metformin is something, uh, sorry, insulin is something which you cannot use at all, right? So we've spoken about whom to screen. It's all when to screen at first visit and then at every recurring uh, visit in every trimester. We've spoken about the tools for screening and management. With this, I hand back to uh, Dr. Shalini or Dr. Pramila.